Well, thank you for such a lovely introduction. I'll try and move up to it. Um, I'm going to talk about soft astronomy, so puns intended, you know, not hardcore. Um, yeah, so, um, so I had some pictures here of some things that you might think of as soft. So in, in this one is a uh, mass spring model. So it's an n-body simulation with springs. Um, and it's not a round body, and it's under a tidal field. It's in a centric orbit around the planet or something, and so it tumbles. So this is a uh, situation with non-principal axis rotation, um, and the object in the solar system that's most well known for undergoing this type of um, motion is uh, Hyperion, actually. So this is um, um, a set of images from the OREX mission, which was um, went to Bainu. It's actually planned to have a, a sample return um, that will come back next year. Um, and uh, so the, the, this is a near-Earth orbit crossing asteroid um, and just, you know, rubble, right? <laughs> so, and it's got this funny top shape, um, which probably means it's deformed. And that is Mars, and it has this big crack in it, um, this canyon, uh, which I'm calling a crack, but uh, that's Thales Marinaris. And so I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, ways you can think about objects in astronomy that are solid. They may be elastic. They can deform. Um, and in, in particular, I got really heavily involved in the uh, spin dynamics part of it. So. Oh, I'm supposed to take my mask. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, just let me know. So um, so the picture of Mars, um, I was kind of curious about, um, so the, the explanation for Mar Valis Marinaris involves stress relief from a um, buildup of volcanic providence, province um, associated with Olympus Mons. But um, when you look at things on Earth, right? So this thing, over here, this is the Great African Rift Valley is a tectonic setting. Tectonic means slow divergence of continental plates, but there's a big rift building. And we think of that as happening on geological timescales. And this thing is a Varanger crater, which is an astronomical event that happened in you know maybe, maybe minutes. But originally, um, the proposal that that was a crater from an uh, impact was very controversial, and that's because it's on Earth, right? So where people are used to thinking about how things happening on geological timescales. And so I was, you could maybe try to turn this around and say, when we see that in space, we automatically assume that it's uh, something that happened instantaneously with an impact. But when we look at something like this, we immediately all still um, think of it as a geological process. So an example, so while I was working on this, New Horizons mission came back with this lovely image of Charon. It has craters on it, and it has these big rift valley. Um, and the most explanations for it are geological, meaning it took long, lots of time. But why does it have to be? Maybe it happened quickly. And so one possibility would be, um, uh, well, so impacts, strong impacts that actually are catastrophic happened in the early solar system. So if well, one of the examples of the Earth-Moon uh, formation, where um, this happened because a really big thing hit the proto-Earth, which was called Theia. But um, uh, if there were big, encountered big strong impacts in the early solar system, there were also big near misses. And the near miss means there's a strong tidal force. And tidal forces are different than impacts um, because they uh, are tensile, they pull instead of compress. And when you pull something, you can make a crack. So that's the, so that's the basic thing where, uh, basic idea. So how strong an encounter do you need to cause a crack in a moon? Um, so if you have tidal deformation caused by a tidal encounter, uh, you could think about what the velocity, what the tidal force is, and so that, yeah, I never wind up having my mouse work on this. Um, any case, the force depends on the radius of the object and the pericenter distance, which I've written here as Q. And um, using the impulse approximation, you can guess at the size of the velocity perturbation on the surface caused by that. 
Um, and so that's just the tidal force times an encounter time scale. And then supposing the object is elastic, um, then you can uh, equate the kinetic energy to the elastic energy. <laughs> and so that the elastic energy depends on how much you've deformed the body. And so I've written that down in terms of this epsilon thing, which is the strain. That's the um, change in length divided by the length. So it's a unitless quantity dis describing how much you've deformed the body. So that tells you what the strain would be on the object caused by a strong tidal encounter. It depends on the mass ratio. But the key parameter that tells you whether it's important or not is the gravitational binding energy divided by the mass of the primary body. And then, so this is something you can estimate to order of magnitude, but the, pro the, um, the biggest problem then is now trying to understand when is this strain important? Like when is it big enough that it would actually cause um, um, to exceed the, the yield stress and then you get tensile failure and then the other big uncertainty is what are the elastic modulus? That's the um, elasticity of things in space. <laughs> so we don't necessarily know what the elastic modulus of ice is in a moon, for example. So, um, so yeah, so how much, what strain would something like ice fail at? And uh, so you can go look up um, rough values based on glaciers, for example. And it turns out to be uh, less than a percent. And um, estimating binding energy is pretty straightforward. Um, elastic modulus, again, there's uncertainty. But um, so if we take the elastic modulus of ice, which is maybe somewhere around one in the one to 10 megapascal region, what that tells you is that in order to have brittle failure, so that's when you yield, you exceed the yield stress, you need to be in a strong tidal encounter regime, which means you need to have a body that's nearly the same size undergoing a really close encounter. So one thing I noticed in this is when you, you take the strain rate and you divide by the gravitational time scale or the time scale for the encounter, you get what's called the strain rate, which is about 10 to the minus six per second. Um, so geological things happen on much, much orders of magnitude lower strain rates, so like continents moving. But laboratory experiments are not necessarily that far off um, for high strain rates. So this is part of the challenge for trying to say something about what would happen to a moon under a strong tidal encounter is you're, um, you're, if you're thinking in terms of geological processes, it's really hard to figure out when they apply and when they don't apply because the tidal encounter regime is really different. So um, yeah, so let me give, show this in a different way. Now I need another hand. So uh, <laughs> I think this is probably the part. Oh, it just started now, but I can't do demos. <laughs> oh, okay, great, wonderful. Okay, I'll just put that in my pocket. Yeah. Okay, is that better? Yeah. So so this is silly putty, right? So um, you're used to. Uh, thinking about the center of the earth as, you know, being ductile because we have, you know, motions inside the center of the earth, but seismic waves go just through the earth just fine. So it's elastic. And so this is, you know, elastic. <laughs> That's just out of order. But if you take your silly putty and you pull it enough, it breaks. Okay. So, um, so this problem is in the elastic brittle setting and that means masses and springs. <laughs> so the springs give you the elastic phenomena, uh, but then you have to decide how do I make, how do I make a simulation uh, give me brittle ph uh, phenomena, which means, so in this particular case, I measured the strain, uh, which is how much the springs are pulled. And then I mark things if it go, goes above some level. But anyway, so this shows you one of our early simulations of a tidal encounter. It's a really soft body that's just barely holding itself against, up against self-gravity. Self you can see it oscillate. Um, so those are normal modes, essentially. Um, this is, I used the graphics engine on rebound because it had this really nice open GL uh, viewing. It really helps to be able to see what's going on um, in this setting. And then, Rebound had this really nice way of adding additional forces. So I uh, just added, added springs. So springs are just, you know, 
you take some length and you apply a force between the point mass particles. So these look like they're spheres, but they're really point mass particles. So the nice thing about, um, so this is a random mass spring model. Uh, there was uh, some ideas in the graphics um, simulation community by this um, guy, Matt, who caught, who actually works in Japan now. I think he's Polish, but um, he showed that uh, this random mass spring model where you generate the particles randomly um, and then hook up springs between particles of, uh, that are within some particular distance, that it had a nice continuum limit. So you could um, take the number of springs per volume and use the spring constant to get the Young's modulus. And the, um, so, so, this, so despite the fact you're like um, in, inspired by graphics community software, you're trying to make blobby things. Um, uh, we need to actually be able to compute real physical quantities from the simulation. Uh, so, so that made a real difference in the in this ability to simulate a solid. So, uh, yeah. So that's a tidal encounter. So this is what it is. It's nothing complicated. It's just you add elastic forces that depend on the uh, the length of the spring compared to some um, rest wavelength. And then we also added damping. I added damping initially because I wanted stable a stable system. Um, and here's this the strain rate is just this, uh, how fast the length of the spring uh, changes compared to the rest. So when you uh, rest length. So when you have a, a damp spring model, that's a viscoelastic spring uh, setting. So uh, because you're you're turning energy into heat through the damping parameters. But one thing to notice is here, here is the forces, both of the forces, the damping forces and the elastic forces are all applied between point, point particles equal and oppositely. And so that means it's gonna conserve momentum and it's gonna conserve angular momentum. So that's great. <laughs> it's like, so, uh, so it sounds really simple. It is really simple. So this is a low complexity code that can accurately model dynamics of viscoelastic materials and conserve angular momentum. So um, yeah, so that means it's really powerful <laughs> and we can do a lot of stuff with it. Uh, so when I was figuring this out, I was like, wait a minute, this is too easy. Why has nobody done this? And I really worried about it for a while and just no, it's, it went back and forth and no, it's just a really good idea. <laughs> so you worry about it. So uh, because I was motivated, <laughs> well, because I was motivated by Mars initially, um, so, so what drove us, you could ask, what drove us into this weird type of simulation? And what drove us into it, drove us into it is I was trying to measure this really small deformation, this less than a percent change in the length of something. And so I needed a simulation technique that let me measure distances really accurately. And so when you deform a spring by a small amount, you can measure it. In fact, you can measure it to 10 to the minus 16. And that means we can do tidal evolution with this code. We didn't know that at the time, but that's what drove us into it was this, I was trying to make a body crack and get in the right physical regime for, you know, uh, Charon or Mars to crack. <laughs> in any case, so because we, uh, so the original paper, the first paper wrote on this, um, I needed to tile a surface because I was working with the moon. So I put a shell on it. And so this is, needlessly complicated. I'd probably never do this again, but the shell in order to be stable needed flexor strength. And we just marked where the strings, the springs extended a little bit longer than this limit on the last, um, on the strain. And so the cracks that we simulated were simply rendered, you know, they're like marked. We didn't actually let the material fail. So, uh, crack propagation is not easy, <laughs> and you could put a lot more physics into this. But um, but this shows you what happens when you have a strong tidal encounter in a regime like a icy body like Dione, and you get cracks and rings like this, and they tend to be on one hemisphere. And the reason they tend to be on one hemisphere is because we're in the strong tidal encounter regime. So we're really close, to, they're really close together. So it's asymmetrical. I mean, normally tidal forces are quadrupolar, but if you're really close, the octopoles and everything else add up. So that's why they're on one side. So we proposed a new geological or geophysical mechanism for our moons. 
and that tidal encounters are a process that happens in space. And we propose it as a possible explanation for these big rifts that are seen in things like in objects like Dione and, and um, Charon. And so we know that really strong collisions happen in the solar system. And so we argued that these had to take place and that the manifestation of them having taken place in the early solar system would be these big cracks. Um, the tricky part, is, so we did try and make some predictions for what the cracks would look like, but really we don't have a lot of detail, like how deep, how wide, all those things. So one could do more uh, on that. And we did propose it as a possible explanation for Mar uh, Valles Marinaris, but there's a whole lot of detail on the alternative explanations. So you'd have to do a lot of work to compete. So, so while I was doing this, I ran this simulation. So this is two body, equal mass bodies. The one that's going around the top is uh, a point mass. Um, and this is the mass spring model. And I'm in the frame of this guy. Uh, and you can see the tidal deformation. In the beginning, the thing bounced because it wasn't in equilibrium. But if you go, let's see if I can, yeah. So if I'll go to later in the movie, what you'll notice is this guy is now rotating and it started not rotating. And so this has been tidally spun up. So I went down to the DPS to um, you know, present the cracking stuff. And I ran into Michael Fronsky who works on tidal evolution. And I showed him the simulation and I said, look, I can do tidal evolution with my code. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, so his first reaction so with me, I have the, with our code, we have the masses and, and the dampers in parallel, but, and that's called the Kelvin Boyd viscoelastic model. And they like to work with uh, springs and dampers in series called a Maxwell model. And he's like, you need to redo your spring model uh, to, to do a Maxwell model. Well, so I'm using the springs to hold it up from self-gravity. So this would have been complicated to do. And I, so I responded, no, you need to modify your prediction for the physical elastic behavior and do a Kelvin Voigt model. And that would have been the end of it, except there was a postdoc there. And he's, he's like, oh, this is trivial. And in like two hours, he sent me a prediction for spin down rates. And the next day, I had points hey. online. So let me show you what we did. So what's going on with tidal spin up? So with tidal... Um, if, if you have a perturber, which I'm showing on the right, and you have a body and it's being tidally um, pulled, uh, if it's spinning uh, really quickly or it deforms, um, it deforms really slowly, this is the slow relaxation, then it doesn't have time to deform. And so it stays around and then there's no torque. And then on the other side, if it deforms instantaneously, then it's perfectly aligned. And again, there's no torque. So it's really this one in the sin, in the middle here where you match the time scale of the, the deformation with the spin and that gives you the strong torque. And so as a result, there's a, a prediction for the torque as a function of frequency. So it's tidal frequency in units of the viscoelastic relaxation time scale. And so you get this, um, you know, you can have it go either way, spin up or you know, spin down and there's a peak. And so that's what they were predicting. So this is a torque uh, and it depends on the mass of the perturber, uh, strong function of radius because it's tidal. And then this thing called the quality <laughs> function that folds in on the frequency dependence. So, in, uh, so like you can have a generalization for resistance and electric, electric setting is uh, impedance. Here you can generalize um, the stress strain relation in terms of what's called a complex compliance. And it's just a frequency dependent, possibly complex function. And so your viscoelastic model uh, gives you the um, quality function. And people usually think of the quality function as a love number times a Q factor. Um, and, and those numbers come out of our, our simplification of more complicated quality function. So this is what they're predicting. And then, so I just measured the torque on my model and those are the red dots. So that's good. So it's the right shape. Uh, 
the biggest problem that we saw. So the prediction of the Kelvin Voigt to scholastic model that they gave me was this purple line and my red dots are a little bit too high. And so we didn't resolve this. Actually, we published a paper with this discrepancy of 30%. At that time, we were like, well, nobody's ever simulated tidal spin up or spin down with the uh, viscoelastic um, body. So we, didn't really, we thought 30% was pretty good error. <laughs> but it took us a while to track down where it was and wh what it came from. And we thought, well, maybe it's a numerical issue. But it turns out it, what the, where the problem was is that most of the predictions for tidal this patient assumed the body is incompressible, but our simulated material is not incompressible. <laughs> and so the 30% description, discrepancy comes from ignoring the bulk viscosity in the um, calculation. So really it was Julianne's problem, not mine, but you know, the simulations didn't have the error so far as we know now. So we haven't actually gone back and done better work. So tidal spin down can be simulated directly using um, a simulated viscoelastic uh, thing, material. It could have been done in the 70s. There's nothing hard about it. You can run it on a laptop. Um, the predicted shape of the viscoelastic response was correct, but with a 30% error that we then later attributed to the neglect of the bulk viscosity in the theoretical prediction. So we got a little bit more sophisticated the following year. <laughs> and we started doing bigger bodies. And so, um, and part of this was inspired by Dar Darren Ragazine. He emailed me and said, you gotta do Haumea. I was like, well, what's exciting about Haumea? So Haumea is a very elongated body. And um, so the question is how long does it take for it to spin down? Um, so we're doing principal axis rotation, so it's not tumbling, and we're wondering about is the prediction for the torque when you average over the spin period, how does it depend on body shape? So this is hard to calculate, but easy to simulate because we don't really care if our body's round. So this is what we found. Uh, so we were sp spinning spheres, and the axis of rotation is the axis of symmetry but they're not tidally locked. And we simulated oblates and prolates. And um, so all of these dots come from the simulations. Haumea is here. Um, and Haumea has a, a, this, we measured the torque in terms of a drift rate for the semi-major axis. And it's about twice as high as it should have been. Uh, so it doesn't really uh, explain any of the difficulties they were having account, uh, accounting for this, the system. We did find ways to put curves through all these dots using um, just scaling laws. And so we guessed at how strain, um, how the strain was set by the tidal field and then averaged it over the orbit to come up with a model that looked like this. So uh, we had a little bit of a discrepancy. Everything okay yeah. at the gallery? What was that? Oh, somebody's, okay. Carl Friedberg needs to mute. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so so that was kind of cool. We actually found the scaling relations that um, people hadn't predicted analytically. So then we decided to do something more complicated, and that's non-principal axis rotation. Uh, so that what if you um, so if you have a body and its angular momentum axis is not not aligned with an axis of symmetry of the body or one of the principal axes, then it tumbles, and so it feels these periodic stress strain cycles. And those damp, they lose energy, angular momentum is conserved, but energy is lost. So, um, so the body um, axes change. Eventually, it winds up spinning around a principal axis. But you can measure the dissipation rate while it's doing the uh, non-principal axis rotation. And there are very good models, <laughs> analytical models. And so the lines show you the analytical models. And the dots show, us, show the simulations. And you can see that over the, the thing, so these are for different oblates and prolates. So the predictions are for oblates and prolates. And as we vary axis ratio or we measure, measure vary the non-principal axis angle. And um, over orders of magnitude, the simulations are really close to the analytical predictions. So the simulation technique is really precise over orders of magnitude. <laughs> 
And that just comes down to the fact that if I take a, uh, two particles and I move them by 10 to the minus 15 in double precision, I can measure it in the simulation. So really small forces and really small deformations are something you can keep track of while conserving any momentum with this simulation technique. So to summarize, we can simulate viscoelastic and tidal evolution of uh, homogeneous, inhomogeneous, non-round, elastically anisotropic. So I didn't really talk about that yet, yeah, Chris. So in practice, how many particles do you need to get conversions? Convergence, yeah. So um, since I've been running on my laptop, I haven't really taken convergence tests all that far. And so we did between, you know, a few hundred to a few thousands of particles. And, um, you know, things are, there's, things are differing by a few percent across that range. What I was more worried about were things like um, the net, the spring network at the edge of the body, because when you think of a particle on the surface, it's not seeing as many springs connecting to it. So the edges are floppy and the tidal forces go as really strong functions of radius. And so I was much more worried about that. Uh, but so you can ask, why is the tidal uh, torque so good? And the reason for that is almost all the dissipations in the center. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the edges didn't actually turn out to have a really strong effect. Um, so other things that we saw is what if you do a lattice? We thought about, well, maybe we could speed up the calculation with fewer springs if we do lattices. So we tried hexagonal closed paths or something, but then they wind up with certain angles where you get really different elastic. So there's anisotropic elasticity. Um, and then, you know, then you're averaging over that. And so those were really bizarre. So, um, so those are the kinds of experiments we did. I'm trying to remember which paper. I think it was the Haumea paper we did those tests. So we did do things with, you know, different densities. We also tracked heat. I was curious, we tracked lopsided tidal heat dissipation in the moon in, a, in, a, in another paper. But so it really tells you because it's a simulation technique, you're not as constrained as you are when you're doing analytical calculations. And this field is dominated by analytical calculations. So, and the study of wobble damping shows that the simulation technique is remarkably accurate. And we know how to scale it. So we had to scale, uh, we had to do a bunch of scaling operations to match those, match those uh, analytical predictions. So uh, yeah, so now let's move to a discovery. <laughs> Can we discover something with the simulation technique? So the New Horizons mission went through the Pluto uh, Peron system and um, there were some surprises. Um, discoveries made when that happens. So to try and orient you, uh, pluto Charon is a binary, and then there are four satellites. It's basically an exoplanet system with four planets, uh, except that it's around a binary. And they're in near, um, near resonant chain. It's near in a, nearly in a resonant chain. So if you take the orbital periods, the, um, um, the ratio, so the, the, the four outer moons, the the, you're right, the uh, minor ones, uh, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra, the ratio of the period to the Charon Pluto period is three, almost three, four, and five. It's not exactly, but it's close. So, uh, similar to the exoplanet systems that are near, uh, ratio, near commensurability ratios for the orbital periods. So, there were two surprises uh, for the dynamical surprises from the New Horizons mission. One is that the, the minor satellites were not spinning slowly, they were spinning quickly. So people had predicted that they would be spinning slowly. It was known they were regular from Hubble Space Telescope light curve observations. And so they assumed they would be like Hyperion in chaotic uh, tumbling states. But when they got there, they found out they were spinning really fast and not tumbling. Well, they didn't know they were not tumbling. They're definitely not tumbling. It's much harder to have something tumbling when it's spinning quickly. Um, so, so this, this tumbling was predicted, but not seen. And then the other surprise was that all four solid satellites had high obliquity. And so that means the spin axis is tilted with respect to the orbital plane. And um, so showing you 
this is how they presented the data. So the uh, orbital um, direction for Pluto Charon orbit is here in this direction on the sky. So this is pole DAC versus pole uh, RA. And these are the directions of the spin axes for the four satellites and they're nearly 90 degrees apart. So they're like tilted down like Uranus is. So that was a surprise. So um, in hindsight, if you estimated using guesses for the material properties, they shouldn't have spun down actually tidally. Um, so, so oddly, there were two papers that predicted this tumbling based on the assumption that most satellites in the solar system have spun down and tidally locked or nearly or not locked if they were not round like Hyperion. So, uh, so how is the system formed? And so how do we explain, you know, or do we want to explain these obliquities? So if, so if Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra, we could ask, are those obliquities primordial? So they were probably born in a disk because they're all in the same plane, low inclination, and they have these re nearly resonant chain orbits. They're low eccentricity. Um, so that tells you, yeah, probably born in a disk. So if accretion onto the, if the satellites form from accretion of small stuff like gas or pebbles, then it would retain the angular momentum of the disk. And then the obliquities should be zero. So you should have the same direction as the disk. But if there was a late stage of accretion, um, then you might have collisions and it would might realign the, the spin directions. So the fact that they're clustered around 90 degrees, is that odd or not? You know, so independent of that, I was just like, yeah, let's see if we can find a mechanism <laughs> that would tilt them over. And you don't know if it's right or not necessarily. So, uh, so we had been doing stuff like this, where we were simulating for a few dozen orbits with lots of particles. Now we need to simulate a lot of orbits, like thousands, hundred thousand orbits. So we went to poorly uh, resolved bodies. Uh, so these the simulation is going to look like that. So, uh, so this kind of shows you, you know, the scale space is big. <laughs> so that's Pluto Charon and now you're zooming in. This is actually a snapshot of an actual simulation. That's the thing that we're simulating. It's a non-round body uh, and it's orbiting a binary. So what do we see? So uh, we first started doing tidal spin down. So we um, let it use the fact that the code can damp to let it slowly spin down tidally. And so you're seeing the spin rate drop here. Um, and the obliquity for stick simulations had intermittent behavior. Um, but as the thing is spinning down, so this maybe we're catching it now in a state where it's in a high obliquity state. One of the things you see is none of this resonance. So these are resonances being crossed. None of this is really accounting for that. So what causes that? We have to figure out what's the dynamical mechanism ca causing that. When we did simulations like this for any of the other satellites like Hydra, they were really boring. Like basically nothing happens. <laughs> so tidal spin down alone, the mean motion, the spin um, orbit resonances. So that's when the spin um, period matches some multiple of the orbital period. We're just not causing excitations. We did see interesting phenomena. So you can see like there's a spin binary resonance in one of these, this was a Kerberos simulation. We saw tumbling excitation, trying to figure out what causes tumbling excitation, which frequencies are being matched. Um, so the, the simulations are not there, you know, they just see whatever's there. <laughs> and then it's up to you to try and figure out what's causing it. Uh, so you may not, your th theoretical setting may not be good enough to, guess at all the possible resonances that are important. So we're using the simulations to do that. This is a blindly sweep through uh, parameter space to find what interesting resonant behavior might be around. So this is what we found. And so in this case, instead of using tidal spin down, we're drifting um, and slowly expanding the pluto charon system. And what that does is it moves the orbital resonance, this three to one orbital resonance, and past the, the system. And this is a stick simulation, but as this resonance, so this is capturing to the three to one 
uh, resonance. You can see this is the orbit divided by the binary orbit period. So that's Pluto Charon. At the same time, the orbit tilts. So it's a resonance that involves the longitude of the ascending node. But at the same time, that top plot shows that the obliquity just really flips. And so this is a resonant mechanism that involves a mean motion resonance and changes obliquity. Um, yeah, so <laughs> we saw the same thing happen in the hydro simulations. Uh, so if we can figure out what causes this, we can probably account for the intermittent variation in the stick simulations without drifting, um, drifting Pluto Charon. And this type of thing probably could have worked on all of them, all of the four minor satellites, because they're all near mean motion resonances. So if it's a mechanism that works near mean motion resonances, it really would operate on all of them, accounting for all of their high obliquities. So what's the orbital resonance? <laughs> so, um, so whenever you have two periods that are close, uh, they're an integer, one of them is an integer times another one, then you can, so you can write that uh, relationship between the periods, you can um, invert it, you get a relationship between the frequencies. So this is angular, uh, these are rotational, angular rotation rates. You integrate that, you get a condition on an angle. Um, so uh, resonant angle. And so those are things that you might be able to derive using a theory, meaning you, you, take, you take some Hamiltonian and expand it and you're hoping you get a term that has that angle in it. And then the size of the amplitude of that term would tell you how strong the resonance is. Um, so the first thing to try and figure out what resonances are likely is to go look for frozen angles. And so that's another technique, that's a technique for finding what resonance would be important in a system. So, uh, so for angles, we, we have to include angles that are relevant to the spin. And so um, an angle that is related to spin is the precession angle of a body. So you take the spin axis and you project it down onto the orbital plane and you keep track of that angle. So we measured that numerically uh, computed numerically in the simulation, and then look plotted angles and see which angles are frozen when the obliquity increase happens. And so this angle winds up being frozen when the obliquity is changing. And the, this is an angle that involves the um, location of the, the satellite, the angle of Charon, so that's the binary angle, and this is the precession angle. So we can call these spin uh, mean motion spin precession resonances, uh, maybe. So uh, and then you know, yeah. <laughs> so this how do how do we think about well physically what is this? So the, what it is is when it's going around in the orbit, you're matching the precession time scale with the orbital uh, time scale. Um, so if you have a if you have a precession, so anything that's spinning, if you're perturbing it on the precession frequency, you can cause it to tilt. And so that comes down to the top, right? And so gyroscope is something that's spinning and uh, it will precess. <laughs> and if I perturb it at the precession frequency, I can get it to tilt. And so we'll see. So if I start doing I have to get it to tilt over a little bit there. Now it's tilted over, but now if I start perturbing it at that frequency, it really either tilts up or it tilts down. So if you get good at this, you can get it to stand up or stand up, but that's basically it. You perturb it at the matching with the precession frequency, it'll tilt over. So to summarize, the tidal spin down times are long for Pluto satellites and they haven't spun down. And in hindsight, that's not surprising actually. Tidal evolution alone doesn't really explain the obliquities. It can kind of explain sixes, but we don't know why. With the spin mean motion uh, resonance, you can explain those, oblique, those obliquity, intermittent obliquity changes. Outward migration of Charon causes capture into a, a resonance that really rapidly changes the obliquity of the minor satellites. And it's um, a compensability between the spin precession rate and the mean motion resonant angle. So, uh, or, or mean motion, should have said mean motion there. So um, you can develop a theory for it. There are two approaches for that. So Sarah Mulholland has uh, 
uh, theory that depends on matching precession rates where the precession rate gets strongly changed near mean motion resonance, or you can work with a direct torque, maybe both are important. So we wrote a paper expanding Hamiltonian out with direct torque and showing you that the strength of these resonances are not even low in, I mean, they're not low, they're not high order in inclination or eccentricity, which means they're strong and they would work uh, for all of the satellites. So um, perhaps all these satellites were previously in mean motion resonances and that's when the obliquity changes happened. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so after this, so this is work we did this summer actually. So we were curious about binary asteroid evolution. So it turns out that a third of near, near Earth objects are binary. And binaries are going to be in the news a lot because, <laughs> because in September, there's going to be an impact with uh, a binary. So the DART mission is on its way, and it's going to slam into this thing at like six kilometers a second. And it weighs 500 kilograms, so that's like a big impact. This thing is dimorphous. It's the uh, secondary for the primary. These are, people don't really know what they look like yet, but, and I doubt it looks like that. But um, this thing is only like 160 meters big, so uh, it's going to really do damage. So, um, so there are two big mysteries in binary asteroid uh, evolution, and I'm going to propose a single way to solve them both, so that's cool. So tidal dissipation estimated from tumbling damping in single asteroids gives a really different number than estimates for binary asteroids. And it's orders of magnitude different. So there's a discrepancy in estimating material properties. Um, the second mystery is um, radiation effects cause the um, two asteroids to drift in semi-major axis, and that's called biorp. So yorp effect is spin up or spin down. Biorp is the uh, the torque on the by radiation on the secondary causes the orbits to either diverge or converge. But the, the, the surprising thing is how fast it's predicted to happen. It's predicted to happen in less than a million years, and then they would fall apart. <laughs> and, and yet, um, near-Earth asteroids, their lifetime is like 10 million years. So there's an, this, there's an issue accounting for their lifetimes. So one thing is this bioorb always assumes they're tidally locked. And so that's a thing we could question, actually. So moving on. Oh, yeah, here's a simulation. So now we're actually going a little bit more than past what we've done before. We were only doing point masses with one resolved body. We've got two resolved bodies. And this is, we're in the frame so that these are uh, same axis. And this one, you can kind of see it. This end is always pointing towards that guy, but it's rocking back and forth. And so this is in a non-principal axis rotation state, even though it's tidally locked. So that's that's going to be kind of a take-home message, actually. So um, yeah, so the, the two resolved bodies means the gravitational field is very not round. And that is expected when you look at the asteroids. They're not round. So we're used to doing simulations around planets that are much rounder. Binary asteroids are significantly non-spherical, both bodies. So this is a simulation of tidal spin down. Then uh, you can measure the rate, tidal spin down rate, which you can see at the top in this really short times uh, blue thing going down like that. But the second panel shows you the obliquity. Um, and so it, at this point, it enters the spin orbit resonance. So that means that long part is always aligned. So it's, it's in a spin synchronous state, but it's obliquity and, um, and this, which is the non-principal axis angle, are remaining high for a really long time after it en enters the this, this spin synchronous state. And so that's what we were seeing with it. It's aligned, but it's rocking back and forth. So, um, so, so this is a long, long thing. So why does it take so long? Because we'd run simulations of Deimos and Phobos and not seen it take so long. We attribute that to these multipolar coefficients that are present in the binary asteroid setting because they're really not wrong. <laughs> so um, yeah, so um, 
Secondary is often assumed to be synchronous. And so that means the bi or and synchronous with no rocking back and forth. And so that means the bi, uh, the bi orb calculations assume that, and that's why they're getting these really um, fast uh, drift rates. But um, there have been lots of proposals to get around this problem of, of how do we keep asteroids, binary asteroids alive? So I did some, some suggestions. Maybe they're born at smaller radii, maybe they're really soft, and so they have. Uh, and so this is part of the discrepancy. They have different material properties than regular asteroids. But basically, light curves um, that find that most many binary asteroids are unspin synchronous states are not going to be good enough to see if they're rocking. And so, uh, so this is what I'm guessing is the solution to the problem is that better light curves are you actually get to a binary asteroid and look and see what it's, see what it's doing. So, uh, so what are the motions? So if you think of an airplane, there are various motions, uh, direction to the primary is when the long thing is the line like this. And this tilting back and forth, you can also call it roll. And I called it short axis tilt before, um, before I was aware of Batia Duke's work where he talked about barrel roll instability. So the ins this instability has also been seen um, in other people's simulations not with the tidal spin down setting, but so yeah, I already showed you this, but uh, it's the same point, <laughs> so let's move on. So, uh, so what if it's, what if it tidally locks, what happens afterwards? So if Bior starts up and then the system is drifting, do we see other resonances that can excite the spin? And we do kind of in some settings. So we do see some obliquity jumps, um, if you have a, an inwardly migrating system where the two are approaching each other, we didn't see any interesting phenomena when things are drifting apart. So even if the system damps down and winds up drifting quickly, it could maybe kick itself out of a principal axis rotation state and wind up back in a more interesting spin state. So let's get to the question of does the bior torque change? So I mentioned that um, all by or torque calculations that assume tidal lock with no rocking. And um, so, we, were, so we, had, we decided we would try and take our spin dynamics uh, simulation output. We can record the angles um, and the orientation of the body in the simulations. So we wanted to tie that to predictions for the torque from the radiative uh, forces. So that comes down to taking a shape model where you have facets and you add up the radiation forces from each facet. And so um, this not so I'd never done a radiative uh, torque calculation before. And so figured the chance that I got it right the first time was zero. So, um, so we went and found a shape model where somebody else had made a prediction from that shape model. So we're using the Squanet shape model because uh, there was a prediction, somebody else had predicted we wanted to make sure our code was giving the same answer. So, uh, so that's the original one. And then we did things like make it rougher uh, and we, we made it a little bit coarser so that we could speed up the calculation. Um, so just taking uh, the squanet model and tilting it back and forth arbitrary, arbitrarily with different um, angles, we found that the uh, torque from the biorp uh, was strongly dependent upon the extent of the uh, tilt. So this is not from a simulation, but it does tell you that it depends on the angle. So the next step is then to take all the instantaneous angles for the spinning object in the simulation and then compute the bi -orb torque. Uh, so the other thing is that that red uh, dots match the black circle. So this is really important because once we got the red dot near the black circle, we knew our calculation was consistent with those in the literature. So we're not measuring garbage anymore, anymore being <laughs> the key, key thing here because you know we started off. So how did we figure out how to get body orientations out of the simulation? So we have a bunch of particles. So this is kind of cool actually. So you use a covariance matrix uh, that depends on the differences in the particle positions at one time and another time in the simulation. And that gives you, you can turn that into a quaternion, uh, quaternion that then you can use to rotate the body. 
So we using this trick, we can get at every output of the simulation and a rotation that would rotate the body back to what it had been initially. So we actually know the rotation and we so we can take a shape model now and rotate it, compute the bio torque from it at every moment in the simulation. So we're not evolving the simulation with the bio torque, but we are computing what the torque would be at every moment in the simulation. And this is what you get. And so during the during the time when you have a lot of non-principal axis rotation, the biorb torque, which is uh, given in terms of this dimensionless number called the B coefficient averages to zero. And then the system drops down and the non-principal axis angle is smaller. And during the later times of the simulation, the biorb coefficient, the B coefficient slowly rises until it eventually approaches the value that would have been predicted for a tidally locked non-rocking situation. So this so it really does show you that this rocking just shuts down the biorb effect. So to summarize, non-principal axis rotation in an asteroid secondary is long lived and should actually you know last a significant fraction of, of the lifetime. And it hasn't been detected. So, <laughs> so we're predicting that asteroid binaries, the secondaries are in non-principal axis rotation states and that's going to account for their lifetime. And so maybe we'll know when the DART mission gets to Dimorphos and uh, before it, it smashes it, <laughs> maybe they'll be able to measure the rotation state. But you can also measure rotation states with radar. So, you know, so, and light drift. So it's something that we want somebody, we, people could either confirm or refute, right? So because the non-principal axis rotation shuts down the biorp torque, it's a way to extend the lifetimes and make them make more sense without having odd material properties predicted for binary asteroids. So, and I, I see that my timing is not terrible. Actually, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I following up someone stole my question earlier about the particle number, but it, it's really about setup and how how do you relate the setup to the way that the universe like how do you build up the thing that's constant in the light so light so within what way do you connect? Oh sorry, within what way do you connect the strange particle? Or vice versa, do you set that and then learn something? So it sounds like the question is, how do we choose numbers of particles and springs? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I have a really low attention span. And so I always do the fastest thing, which is the least number of particles I think I can get away with first. And then I double it to finish the paper. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry. No, um, so it depends on the problem you want. So for these heavily, like with lots of particles, we're only measuring things for fractions of rotation states. We try to run it with enough particles so that it's not being affected by the small number, the numbers of particles. But the the random spring model, the, the, this mat, random mass spring model, you don't want particles too close together because then they're not really part of the thing. So we, um, when I choose the particles, uh, you know, so I choose random numbers and then I either accept a particle or not. I don't let them get ever too close to each other so that there's a range of um, particle distances between each other. And then you just keep generating particles until you stop being able to fit them in. And so that gives you a, um, a range of distances between the particles. Then the springs, we connect up all pairs of springs um, up to a certain length. And you, the goal, you need to have a certain number of springs per particle Otherwise, it acts like a really patchy foam. And when you when you stretch a foam, it's like you get these really big holes in it. So you don't want that in this because you want it to act like a solid. So the number for that is like 15 springs per node. And that number comes out of um, Cott's tests where he did a static beam test. And he was like, when does my prediction for the um, Young's modulus mass match the analytically predicted dip for a static beam to deform under gravity? And it started matching with 15 springs per node. And so we adopted that as the minimum 
Um, so you can play around with more complicated spring networks. And supposing you wanted to do something oxetic, like you pull it and expand it or something, you can play games with, I'm only gonna make stiff springs that are small and loose springs that are big and get foam-like behavior, all sorts. And so there's a whole field of like, let's do interesting mass spring networks to get interesting material behaviors in terms of young modulus. and. Um, so, or in biophysics, you see people doing uh, like cartilage modeling where they have um, very nonlinear properties of, of these elastic materials. <laughs> so you could do stuff like that if you want, wanted to. And I, I did play around with this a little bit because I was kind of hoping to get an incompressible solid model because ours was compressible. Uh, and but I never really succeeded in something that was nice. So it's something we could get back to. I, I'm not sure if this answered your question, but you know, but just to kind of give you the feeling for the complexity of what kinds of things you could think about doing. So for the long simulations, we just under-resolve the body and don't worry about resolving the features in it. And I think the largest particle simulations we did were ones we were trying to map the internal heat distribution. So we tried that with the uh, with the moon. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Uh, well, great talk. Uh, I had a question about the uh, at the beginning you had like these of great simulations with like, like drive by like tidal encounters. Yeah. And and it, even in the first one you showed, it seemed like after the body had already passed, the the the, the planet was was still like fluctuating in a way, like, just like ringing like from that last encounter. So I, I was curious if you had any idea of of like the of how much heat that that could generate in like internally within these planets and what could the consequences of that be for say like an ice world like Sharon which is out in the, the depths of the solar system this is like an icy world what that heating could do yeah so um I think in all the settings that we simulated the heat budget was irrelevant except for the moon and so mapping the internal heat distribution for the um for the moon was was the one setting where we were really trying to understand where the heat went inside. Uh, so but that doesn't mean you couldn't find a setting where you would be more interested in the heat. So the ringing, it, it is showing normal modes. And if you take that and you decompose it and take a Fourier spectrum of it, you'll get the normal modes. <laughs> so we did that in one paper. In one paper. It was like, actually, it was, we were following this paper called Apple Seismology, where somebody was uh, measuring the, the uh, normal modes of an apple. And our, because we had uniform density model, we were like, we don't want the Earth because the Earth is not uniform density. So the Apple Seismology paper was awesome, but we ma matched the spectrum really well. Uh, <laughs> and the, then the damping rate. So oddly, with these tidal things, damping is always at the bottom. Uh, and that's because the tidal stress is largest at the bottom. It's so very counterintuitive because you think of pulling, it's deforming more on the surface, but the heat is always at the bottom of every of, of whatever shell that you're working with. Yeah, so um, with this thing, everything would scale with it. And so it, it doesn't actually invalidate whatever I was trying to show, but trying to understand the Yarkovsky effect and how it's affected by thermal effects as well as surface uh, roughness yeah. and whether they're valleys. And yeah, this is like a huge set of literature. Uh, <laughs> and I don't think it's resolved. It's not resolved at all, right? So, and the, the and, and also I found I very, so there's this nice paper by an Israeli group, I forget who the first author was, where they tried to come up with a, a roughness um, statistic and then match that to the Yarkovsky and the Yorp and the Bayorp. Uh, and so they may be the only one that had kind of a qualitative like feeling where you understood how it scaled. 
Because I find with when I was picking a body, I'd look at the body and I'd go, can I predict whether it's big or little? I had no idea. But I think we were doing the most vanilla, simplest model with no thermal, no conduction, no, you know, no, you know, nothing, no cool, no hot valleys and cool sure. surface, you know, so nothing that is part of what people worry about with with the thermal models for Yarkovsky effect. Zoom and then someone the last question. My question was very similar to the paper in class uh, I was wondering about the relationship between the equational state and the string state. I, if I wanted to prove these for a binary star study the size of evolution of a, a star, I maybe I'm too naive and we would expect a relationship between the string that you choose and, and the equation state. Yeah, so this particular a random mass spring model, the Poisson ratio is a uh, quarter. And uh, so what, how much deformation, it's, I think it's fairly linear in terms of pressure, what the density, uh, how's the density vary with pressure. So, uh, so it's much simpler than anything anybody would use for a hydrodynamic setting. So I don't, uh, yeah, I was, I was discussing with Chris and you know, you should discuss this with Chris. Like, what would you have to do to do interesting tidal, uh, angular momentum conserving tidal models for stars which are hydrodynamic. So we, we started with SPH with this and I couldn't measure the deformations well enough, but an SPH might probably, I think has a problem with angular momentum conservation. So, <laughs> so uh, I mean, would that not work? Or not, so I don't know. I mean, it's a it's an interesting question for future work. So what what could be done? But in any case, Chris was also interested it's to catch like it. Oh yeah, I mean they would be terrible because <laughs> yeah yeah. I mean I I basically been doing solids, not anything that flows or is yeah. plastic or ductile, right? So yeah, <laughs> I mean this doesn't mean that solids are boring, but. <laughs> I'm not sure if it would help you with binary binary stars. Okay, great. So we have um, a reception outside, also a welcome for um, our current crop of pre-doc students. So uh, we'll see you. So I was going to introduce them all, actually. Oh, you did. Yeah, okay, great. Oh, yeah. I thought that great. was supposed to be first. Here. Let me get out of the way. Here. So hi everyone, as, as uh, most of you or many of you know, I'm sure, um, we have a new class of pre-docs that, um, that arrived at the beginning of February. These are students from uh, around the world, different institutes that spend five months working with one or more CCA mentors. We wanted to um, introduce them and welcome them. That was um, delayed a little bit because of Omicron, but now that we can have receptions again, we decided it's a good time to do it. So I'm just gonna uh, very briefly introduce everyone and those who are here can, uh, can stand up or at least wave. And apologies if I um, if I mispronounce your your surname. So first um, we have Alex uh, Gagliano, who's uh, from Illinois. He's over there. So Alex is here working with uh, Gabby Contardo, Dan Foreman Mackey, David Hogg, and Shirley Ho. Uh, his project is called Reinforcement Learning Recommendation Engine for Targeted Transient Follow Up. And then um, just for for introducing and so you can kind of kind of hook into something for your memory, I've I've stolen one of the interesting. Um, uh, aspects about them from their slides. So for Alex, I note that he raced a double metric century on a three-person bike, which sounds awesome. And personally, I'd like to, to learn more because I've only done a, uh, a um, imperial century on a, on a one-person bike. So this sounds even, even more interesting. Um, next, we have Mike Lau from uh, Monash. Hi, Mike. Um, Mike is working with Matteo Cantiello and Adam German um, on hydro simulations of planetary engulfment. And uh, Mike has a sword carrying license in Australia. I don't know whether that <laughs> translates to uh, New York City. Uh, so, you know, beware. <laughs> um, next up, we have Sophia Lilingen. Did I slaughter that? Lilingen. Okay, thank you. Um, coming to us from Surrey. She's working with Adrian Price Whelan and Catherine Johnston on um, information content in stellar streams and time dependent potentials. She uh, has once jumped out of a plane and uh, took a selfie with 
quokkas afterwards. I had to look up what those are. They're apparently short-tailed scrub wallabies. They're the cutest things ever. Yeah, they look very cute. And my, my Google search revealed that, that fact about them. So very cool. <laughs> uh, next, we have Manami Roy. Hi, right, Manami. Um, she's coming to us from the Raman Research Institute. She's working with Kung Yi Su, Stephanie Tonneson, Drummond Fielding, and myself um, on the effect of satellite galaxies on the circumgalactic medium of the host galaxy. And um, in her spare time, she likes to play the ukulele and sing. So uh, welcome. Then uh, finally, we have uh, Brent Tan. Hi, Brent. Uh, Brent comes to us from UC Santa Barbara. He's working with Drummond Fielding, uh, Greg Bryan, and Yan Fei Jang on the fate of cold gas in galactic winds. And uh, Brent is a big fan of Brandon Sanderson's books. All right, so welcome to all of our pre-docs. If you, you see them around, uh, you know, please say hello, have a coffee, have lunch, whatever. And I uh, hope that, that all of you have been having a good time so far. As I've said before, if you, know, if you are, or if, especially if you aren't, please come talk to me. And uh, yeah, we're ha very happy to have you here. So please go enjoy your food and drink. Thank you. <laughs>